Good morning. Uh, we are about to begin, so may I ask the, uh, the representatives to kindly take their seats? Good morning, <clears throat> Madam Executive Secretary, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the multi-stakeholder dialogue on the operationalization of the local communities and indigenous peoples platform. This dialogue sets an historic milestone in our process. Historic because it is the first time that such an event is to be co-moderated by an elected presiding officer, a position that I am privileged and honored to hold and as substitute chair and a representative from the indigenous peoples organizations, Ms. Grace Balawag. The Indigenous Peoples' Organizations concluded a process of nomination and endorsed Ms. Grace Balawag for a co-moderator role. Ms. Balawag is from the Indigenous Peoples' Group Kan Kanaye Ingorot from the Cordillera Administrative Region, Philippines. She is also a member of the IIPFCC Global Steering Committee representing the Asia Indigenous Peoples' Network. Before I go further in my opening statement, I would like to invite the Indigenous Peoples' Organizations, Mr. Kapupu Diwa, to take a moment to dedicate our time together here according to their practice. Please rise mm -hmm. and hold hands. <coughs> Nous allons faire euh, une prière. Euh, il est demandé de se tenir euh, la main euh, pour essayer d'évoquer nos esprits euh, de nos ancêtres, en fait qu'ils puissent nous assister, que la planète, notre planète, soit comme nous faisons la chaîne là, que les esprits, parce que nous, comme les peuples autochtones, et nous parlons sur les effets des changements climatiques, dont la nature a c'est un cordon ombilical entre la nature et le peuple autochtone. Donc la nature dépend des peuples autochtones, comme les peuples autochtones aussi dépendent de la nature. Raison pour laquelle euh, nous allons exhorter nos ancêtres qui puissent nous assister pour euh, euh, cette occasion de présentation de notre plateforme euh, sur le savoir. Euh, endogène et autochtone. Voilà. Euh, donc, comme nous faisons, euh, moi-même, je, je suis euh, le chef coutumier des peuples autochtones qu'on appelle pygmées en République démocratique du Congo, donc les Bambouti. Euh, là, euh, comme c'est une cérémonie euh, d'investir pour nous, c'est-à-dire chacun de vous, doit essayer d'évoquer donc de, de sa langue intérieurement comment il prie et là on va faire la donc la communication interspirituelle pour qu'il y ait une force vibrante pour la réussite de notre session d'aujourd'hui oshi oshi uma bala mangenge matuluka uma bala Mangenge yo yo ma bala mangenge. Hey, alaka, alaka e. Tu as ouvert ça non? Où mon neveu n'a pas obé? Hey alaka, ici obé ino. Alaka e, alaka. Hey tata alaka e. Où je suis mon neveu n'a pas obé? Tete ano, na ba sumbu bose, na ba tuba uile, ba tuba se ba shwe ano. Eh alaka e, alaka. 
alaka eh hey! watinga uo ushwe uno watinga uo ushwe uno watinga uo ushwe uno watinga ano ashwe ano eh hey! tata mzoka e hey, ombe alaka to ushima sana e hey, alaka wetu alaka wetu ushwe ulo leba na bobe Vous soulevez comme ça. Tata, va mon abana bobe. Ba ushima. Ba ushima tata. O toeche makala tu ite ashi obe. Eh alaka ushwe. Alaka. Hi. Hi. Hi, 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 hey. hey, na tata na wana muti we sinja, hey, na mana wana muti we sinja. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Kapupu. Colleagues, friends, it is not a coincidence if such an innovative format in terms of inclusiveness in a process was agreed. Was agreed in, uh, in terms of of the inclusiveness in the process was agreed in Marrakesh last November. The success of this conference was a result of a multitude of individual and collective commitments. The commitment of all parties in this process and of all its stakeholders, including indigenous peoples and local communities. In this respect, I would like to thank the Moroccan presidency, whose leadership in Marrakesh resulted in the launch of the work to operationalize the local communities and indigenous peoples platform, work which is bringing us together here today and tomorrow. In December 2015 in Paris, the COP adopted decision one CP21, which in its paragraph 135, recognizes the need to strengthen knowledge, technologies, practices, and efforts of local communities and indigenous peoples relating to addressing and responding to climate change and establishes a platform for the exchange of experiences and sharing of best practices on mitigation and adaptation in a holistic and integrated manner. One year later, COP22 agreed to adopt an incremental approach to developing the local communities and indigenous peoples platform and requested the chair of the Substa to initiate this process by convening the open multi-stakeholder dialogue at Substa 46. COP22 also invited parties and other stakeholders to submit their views on the purpose, content, and structure of the platform to inform the multi-stakeholder dialogue prior to this session. Six parties, including a group of parties, a joint submission from four constituencies, and 20 organizations have made their submissions. The submissions are made available on the UNFC CCC page, and the Secretariat will take us through the main elements of the views expressed when we turn to the relevant sessions of our agenda today and tomorrow. The submissions inform our dialogue, and all these submissions helped us significantly to frame the agenda for the dialogue and identify key questions that would guide our discussions over the next two half days of our event. Dear colleagues, dear friends, the dialogue should help us discuss and identify clear options for the purpose, functions, and structure of the platform. It should help us determine who the platform would primarily serve, as well as articulate clear suggestions about what value might be added through the platform. The outcome of the dialogue will be captured in a report to be prepared by the Secretariat and considered at Substa 47 next November here in Bonn, under a new agenda item, 
local communities and indigenous peoples platform. The consideration of this item should be concluded at the same session by forwarding recommendations for operationalization of the platform to COP23. Just as a reminder for us in the room today and tomorrow, I would like to reiterate that we are in a discussion format at this multi-stakeholder dialogue. This is not a negotiating forum, but a scene to exchange and share participants' experiences and expectations, allowing for greater mutual understanding. Before we delve into organization of the dialogue, I would like to invite Grace to provide her opening remarks as a co-moderator for this dialogue. Grace, you have the floor. Thank you, Carlos. Madam Executive Secretary, Your Excellencies, State Parties, Friends, good morning. It is my honor to co-moderate this historic event as a representative from the Indigenous Peoples Organizations. And my great pleasure to be here, to be with you all here today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the IIPFCC Global Steering Committee for endorsing my nomination to do so, as well as all the IP regional and local networks which provided support. I would also like to thank both the French and Moroccan Presidency for their leadership in Paris and in Marrakesh, which was instrumental for this inclusive and participatory process and helped engage indigenous peoples in shaping the platform. The presence of the presidency at this dialogue today further demonstrates the continuous efforts to support this process and through this process to recognize the needs of our communities and respect the rights of the indigenous peoples. Indeed, this is a starting point on the realization and implementation of the Paris Agreement on the respect of human rights, including indigenous peoples' rights, on the contribution of indigenous peoples' traditional knowledge, practices, and technologies, and other decisions such as the IPLC platform. For indigenous peoples, the establishment and operationalization of the local communities and indigenous peoples platform would be a contribution to the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the ILO 169, the Sustainable Development Goals, and all other international human rights and environmental agreements adopted and signed by the states. It is an opportunity for a knowledge exchange between indigenous peoples, state parties, and other stakeholders. As mentioned by the SABSTA chair, the secretariat has received a, submissions from a number of parties and stakeholders to inform our dialogue. This is very encouraging. And these submissions, all submissions, help us significantly to frame the agenda for the dialogue today and tomorrow and identify key questions that would guide our discussions over the two half days of our event. Dear friends, your excellencies, I am looking forward to a rich exchange of ideas and experiences. I am counting on the constructive engagement of all parties indigenous peoples and local communities and all stakeholders in advancing our work during the session so that the SABSTA 47 in November has a solid basis for considering the new item, local communities and indigenous peoples platform that will be on the agenda. Finally, we hope for more support towards a transformational and ambitious climate actions by all parties together with indigenous peoples and local communities and other non-party stakeholders at various levels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grace. The Executive Secretary, Patricia Espinosa, has shown great leadership on advancing this work. She has stressed the importance of the voice of indigenous peoples to be an integral part of the conversation in ensuring that the Paris Agreement serves all people and protects lives and livelihoods. 
it is now my pleasure to invite the Executive Secretary, Patricia Espinosa, to deliver her keynote address. Patricia, you have the floor. Thank you, Carlos. I want to start by saying how much I appreciate, how honored I feel to be able to be part of this historic event, this historic day. Coming from a country with a very a rich um, a culture derived uh, to an enormous extent from uh, the richness of its uh, many indigenous peoples. Um, I do uh, feel this as uh, an agenda and a process that is really very, very close to my heart. So let me start by thanking Carlos Fuller, Chair of Substa, and Grace Balawak, the representative from the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change, for presiding over this meeting. And let me thank all of you for joining us today. Your participation contributes to a robust and meaningful dialogue. I'm really happy and glad to be able to be here. With last November's entry into force of the Paris Climate Change Agreement and ratification now by 145 countries, the era of implementation has begun. The agreement unites the world in action on one of the greatest challenges we have ever faced. Indigenous people must be empowered in this effort. I believe indigenous people truly understand the climate change. You are often at the front lines of climate impacts and witness their devastating effects. You see the connection between a healthy planet and healthy, vibrant communities. The Paris Agreement recognizes the role of indigenous people and local communities in building a world that is resilient in the face of climate impacts. This recognition aligns with the Sustainable Development Goals that commit to leave no vulnerable group behind, protect the ecosystems we rely on, and open opportunity for all. Today's event marks an important milestone for the local communities and indigenous peoples platform, which will promote inclusive work towards the vision outlined in the Paris Agreement. Paris gave us a mandate to establish this platform. Inputs from this meeting can make the platform a practical and effective resource. The launch of this platform will foster meaningful exchange with local communities and indigenous peoples. Engaging these groups, engaging you in the global effort to curb emissions and build resilience in local communities holds great potential to protect and improve the well-being of people. This dialogue is your opportunity to help this platform fulfill that potential. We need your voice to understand how to create a platform that best serves the needs of indi the indigenous community. We need your knowledge to build bridges between indigenous communities and other groups acting on climate change. To make sure the voice of the indigenous people is well represented in our process, the indigenous people's constituency is leading, for the first time, this open dialogue alongside the chair of our science and technology body. This is a way for indigenous peoples to help make the platform a force for transformative change. And uh, I do uh, want to thank you, Grace, for accepting to hold this responsibility. We encourage all indigenous peoples to get involved, and I welcome those of you who are here in Bonn to be part of this discussion. This platform cannot be successful without you, just as the Paris Agreement cannot succeed without you. So I ask you to be active and engaged, especially at the national level. Today's dialogue should lead to a clear view of what the platform can do to achieve its purpose. We need input on the structure of the platform, who it will serve, and how it can help communities. We have also asked for information on these topics from the indigenous people's community. These submissions will be presented with the results of this dialogue
to governments in a report for consideration at COP23 here in Bonn in November. With the voice of indigenous people as part of the conversation, we make sure the agreement serves all people and protects lives and livelihoods. And we move closer to truly sustainable development. I encourage you all to be part of this conversation. Lead by example and work collaboratively with governments, the private sector, academia, and all stakeholders to take action on climate change. Together, we rise to meet the great climate and sustainability challenge we face. Together, we can deliver the promise of the Paris Agreement to all people on this planet today and for the generations to come. Thank you very, very much. I look forward to seeing the outcomes of this dialogue and supporting the local communities and indigenous peoples platform as it is developed. And I do look forward to seeing hopefully many of you back here in Bonn in November. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia, for your inspirational words. Your leadership on advancing this work and making sure that the voices of the most vulnerable groups are heard is an encouragement that the platform we are aiming to further define at this dialogue will be key in paving the way for more understanding and recognition of the needs and role of the indigenous peoples and local communities. Let me assure you, Patricia, and the participants that Grace and I are committed to ensure that this dialogue has a tangible outcome. Allow me now to briefly explain the proceedings and expectation of the dialogue. In consultation with Grace, I have developed an agenda that you now have in front of you. First, and through a panel discussion, participants will be introduced to a range of existing experiences and opportunities with the involvement of local communities and indigenous peoples and with the use of traditional knowledge. The Secretariat will then provide an overview of the submissions, focusing on three clusters of functions that emerge from the analysis of these submissions. Knowledge, climate policy and action, and capacity for engagement. Following this presentation and drawing from these key elements, it is proposed that participants discuss concrete functions and content for the platform. We will then move to discussing the nature and possible structure of the platform, again drawing from key elements in the submissions made by parties and organizations that will be presented by the Secretariat. Let's make use of the time we have today and tomorrow for rich discussions and concrete outcomes. I'll now turn it over to Grace for introducing the framing session. Thank you, Carlos. Dear friends, as you can see from the agenda, we are now turning to session two with a panel discussion to set the scene on existing experiences with the involvement of indigenous peoples and local communities in various UN and other international processes. As reflected in the submissions, there are many relevant processes that engages indigenous peoples and local communities and also recognize and strengthen these knowledge systems. To name some, the Convention on Biodiversity and its Nagoya Protocol, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the Arctic Council, the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, High-Level Advisory Body to the ECOSOC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and UNESCO. This framing session will provide a good opportunity for us to get an overview of at least some of this ongoing work. Carlos and I are very grateful today to have the following people who work closely with indigenous people's organizations, 
who will be our panelists. Ms. Hindo Omaro Ibrahim from the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change, and Mr. Douglas Nakashima from UNESCO, and Ms. Juti Mathur Philip from UNDP. It is my, it's also my great pleasure to introduce Stephen, Stephen Leonard, Senior Climate Policy Analyst with the C4, or Center for International Forestry Research, who will facilitate this session, which we expect to be very dynamic and informative to bring us to a shared understanding of these existing experiences. So without delay, let me give the floor to Stephen. Other facilitators can come up forward. Good morning, um, and uh, thank you, uh, Chair of the Substa, um, and the very honourable and a very true global, global leader um, on Indigenous issues, Grace Balawag. Um, good morning, distinguished delegates, uh, representing Indigenous peoples and local communities, party representatives, and friends. I'm extremely honoured to be included in this very special event today. I very much look forward to hearing a useful discussion leading to the operationalization of an effective platform for engagement of local communities and Indigenous peoples. This, in my view, is perhaps one of the most important platforms launched by the UNFCCC in recent times. The importance of Indigenous peoples to climate change, mitigation and adaptation really cannot be overstated. In this context, I'm very pleased to invite to join me here what are speaking of? Coming here? Yep. Um, for this first session, this will be very much to contextualise the discussion, as has been mentioned. Um, Ms. Yoti Mater Philip of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Mr. Douglas Nakashima of the United Nations Environment and Social Cultural Organisation, UNESCO. And Ms. Hindu Omaru Ibrahim on behalf of the Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change. Hindu. <laughs> You'll be first. Yeah. Okay, so Hindu. You'll be, you'll be going first. Um, testament to the increasing recognition of the importance of Indigenous peoples to different international processes, there's been an increasing number of platforms put in place within UN processes. It would be great to hear from you in relation to the different platforms that are out there that you've been involved with as well as the challenges that have been confronted on the subject of engagement and participation of Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. It's really a great pleasure to have this uh, event happen here. Then the decision is really uh, having put in into the practice. So for my little experience that, just to tell you, Indigenous peoples are taking in the many UN bodies around the world. So I cannot 
enumerate all of them here, but I can give you just uh, some of examples that we already uh, uh, getting involved or need in doing the work jointly with state parties and other stakeholders who are uh, in the system. So firstly, we have uh, Indigenous Peoples uh, uh, Permanent Forum and Indigenous Peoples Expert Mechanism. So how those are established? At the beginning, we had the Indigenous Peoples Movement where we want to have the uh, UN Declaration on the Right of Indigenous Peoples to get adopted because we are the one who are working always with the environment. We are the one who are living in certain kind of areas who are protecting all the world biodiversity. And then we saw that we have to be in all those United Nations movement in order to make all our experiences and all our contributions to the international decision makings. So in this one, there was an establishment of the working group. And in this working group, it facilitate the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples through those mechanisms where we discuss uh, side and side with the state parties and we, we, uh, we were there during the informal meetings and during also the formal meetings and that come out with the establishment of the permanent forum and the expert mechanism. And now in the permanent forum, we have the seven regions of the indigenous peoples who are defined officially sitting together and having the gathering there. So, and this is the bodies who is under the ECOSOC, where is the headquarter of the UN and in New York. And we have every year a big forum that indigenous peoples, thousands and thousands of them coming and gathering there. And with the state parties, we think two weeks, two, so two full weeks of discussion and negotiations in our issues where we are fully and effectively participating. And beside that, we have also this instance of expert mechanism based in Geneva, where we have our own expert from indigenous peoples, expert in the different thematic areas, but within the seven regions, where they gather and produce the reports, technical reports and expert reports and sharing with the state parties where we come out with this decision and the solutions adopted by the countries where they have to implement the rights of indigenous peoples and the knowledge of indigenous peoples. But within many UN agencies, I can say just like we have Jeff, we have IFAS, we have UNDP and others, they have a special staff dedicated for indigenous peoples 100% where they are a focal point making the liaison of the work of indigenous peoples at the international level, but also at the regional and national level and linking up with what the secretariats of those agencies are doing. So we have our special rapporteurs on the right of indigenous peoples, who is an independent body also working for the rights of indigenous peoples, but we have also rights for environment and the climate change issues and many other issues and that help to brought up with the other expert independent and raise the issues of indigenous peoples. So to end, we, uh, let me give you the example of the sister convention of the Rio, who is the CBD. So the biodiversity conventions, we have especially the article 8G where we sit at the working group. And this working group is by indigenous peoples with indigenous peoples. In this working group, we have the friend of chair where we always consult with the chair of each working group to make sure that we have the safeguard and we have the rights and knowledges who are reflect and protect by the state parties. And we have also chairing uh, the, a advisory body who is calling a, a steering committee where the COP take this decision of establishment and renew always the mandate of this advisory body where they make the linkage directly of our technical and political needs in order to better implement the UN CBD conventions. And in this one, to make it practical, we negotiated in 2010 the Nagoya Protocol in access and benefit sharing because we cannot just just to give the knowledge, but we want to see how our peoples, our communities can get benefit on them. So just a few, for these few examples, you see like the UNFCCC is a bit behind the other 
uh, UN agencies and especially through the uh, UN uh, convention uh, of, of the three Rio conventions. So this is not the first time that indigenous peoples are participating actively in giving the solution to protect the biodiversity around the world and to protect also the peoples and the rights of the peoples who are depending through this biodiversity. Just to as remind, indigenous peoples protecting more than 80% of the world biodiversity. And that's where we have all our knowledge and how we can transmit it and how all those knowledges are getting, growing and helping us to get our adaptation, mitigation and sustainable way of life with uh, our nature. So those are some of the examples I can give you here and we are really very happy and great to be with you and have the conversation around how we can establish the indigenous people's knowledge platform and get us involved. We are here all to help and we are together. I think together always we said we can achieve and in order to do not leave no one behind, we need to come and it's the right time to establish this one to save the planet and save the peoples who are living in this planet. We are ready to collaborate with you and help, but we need the space to be very participatory and open to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hindu. It's um, it's been a it, it's been an amazing experience. I think for, for for many of us in the room here to be watching the way that the engagement of Indigenous peoples within the UNFCCC process has has evolved, um, and now there's there's work happening at the Green Climate Fund, um, and here too. And I think it's it's very important to be looking at the links um, between platforms and um, and and dialogue. Um, uh, to formal processes uh, in, in this context. Douglas, um, if we'll turn to you now. Um, so I understand that UNESCO is placing um, more emphasis on, uh, on, in, on Indigenous peoples, especially in the context of the IPCC and recognition of Indigenous knowledge within the IPCC, as well as the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, otherwise known as IPBES. If you would be able to provide us with an overview of these processes and your experience with the involvement of local communities and Indigenous peoples, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, distinguished delegates, uh, uh, representatives of the Indigenous peoples, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for having this opportunity to share some of our experience at UNESCO uh, in the processes uh, relating to uh, uh, local communities and indigenous peoples platform uh, that's in the making and uh, um, thank you very much to Hindu for framing the discussion uh, I will focus uh, on UNESCO's work specifically in relation to the common component of knowledge which could be a component of importance within the platform um, just very briefly UNESCO of course is the U United Nations educational scientific and cultural organization so we have a very broad mandate which touches upon uh, many different aspects that relate to, to the work uh, and discussions here on the platform. And specifically, uh, I'm hitting a program on local and indigenous knowledge systems that's in its 15th year, a cross-cutting program that is both uh, interdisciplinary, bringing, bringing together natural scientists, social scientists, and the cultural aspects uh, into one, but uh, more importantly, transdisciplinary in terms of uh, crossing the, the, the borders between the, uh, scientific knowledge and indigenous people's knowledge. So uh, I've been asked to uh, talk uh, somewhat to the experience we're having with the uh, IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and also IPES, which is the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And the challenge there is basically to bring to, to work at the science policy interface and bring to decision makers the best available knowledge. And the best available knowledge is, of course, the best available knowledge from the science side, but it is also knowledge coming from local communities, coming from indigenous peoples. And the challenge is how to bring together all of those knowledge sets to have the best knowledge available for uh, environmental decision making and specifically decision making in relation to climate change, adaptation, mitigation, observation of the impacts of climate change. Um, 
very quickly, we worked considerably with IPCC uh, in the, uh, or on, recently they, re they released their uh, fifth assessment report. Uh, we worked closely, especially with Working Group 2, uh, in uh, organizing workshops with the chair of Working Group 2 and members of the authors of the uh, IPCC assessment to bring them together with Indigenous knowledge holders and experts on Indigenous knowledge to begin to the process of uh, bridging between scientific knowledge and Indigenous knowledge. We also compiled uh, a literature review so looking at what's already out there in the scientific and gray literature uh, in order to package it in a way that's accessible for uh, scientists. Many of the scientists in the assessment processes are, are not uh, used to dealing as yet with uh, Indigenous people's knowledge. Uh, so it was a, 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 an opportunity to engage with them, open up a new area of work and discussion uh, that uh, could then allow them as climate scientists also take into consideration observations and knowledge and practices coming from indigenous peoples and their communities. And this of course led to a very positive result in terms of recognition of uh, indigenous knowledge uh, in the summary for policymakers of the uh, synthesis report for the fifth assessment. Um, IPES, then, as I mentioned, uh, this is another platform doing assessments, but here on biodiversity and ecosystem services. There, they recognize the principle of uh, uh, taking on board indigenous and local knowledge in their assessments. And they have a specific task force that is organized on indigenous local knowledge. UNESCO is uh, serving as the technical support unit for that task force. And uh, IPBES, the, the uh, task force on indigenous and local knowledge, is working on developing approaches and procedures for building uh, indigenous knowledge into their assessments. They're also working on a participatory mechanism to increase and reinforce the participation of indigenous peoples. So on the screen, uh, there's a, a kind of a schematic which just uh, uh, represents in a way uh, what could be a knowledge component uh, of the uh, of an LCIP uh, platform, just to illustrate some of the things that uh, uh, UNESCO has been working with, looking at how uh, knowledge from indigenous peoples and local communities on the one hand and scientific knowledge can be brought together within a platform uh, to contribute towards this objective of having the best available knowledge uh, present, ready, accessible for decision makers. But also looking, <clears throat> these are the yellow arrows, how uh, indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge, they can work together to co-produce new knowledge. So identify uh, key problems in relation to climate change, uh, um, uh, assessing the impacts or uh, climate change adaptation, and co-producing new knowledge together by bringing together elements of, an, of indigenous people's knowledge and scientific knowledge for uh, all, it, all it's the objective of uh, uh, creating knowledge for uh, decision making. Uh, very quickly, I wanted to touch on a few modalities because I think that may be a part of the discussion as well. What types of modalities uh, have been piloted in the last few years in relation to how to bring together uh, indigenous people's knowledge and uh, scientific knowledge? Because this, of course, is a challenge. Everyone increasingly is recognizing the importance of bringing together multiple knowledge sets, but how do you do it? So I mentioned briefly about the uh, targeted reviews of the existing scientific and gray literature. Uh, there is some information out there uh, that is documented and that already can be mobilized to be accessible to uh, processes such as these. But you need to go beyond that because much of the knowledge is oral knowledge. It's not recorded, documented specifically. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, knowledge that you need for climate change decision making is not necessarily already uh, recorded and understood. So we've also been experimenting with dialogue workshops that bring together uh, indigenous uh, peoples, indigenous knowledge holders, uh, meteorologists, climate scientists, and, uh, and decision makers to, to come together in a face-to-face -face dialogue to uh, discuss together what identified together the, the challenges and the knowledge that's required. We're also working with uh, transdisciplinary observatories uh, looking at uh, that are based in local communities, working with uh, indigenous peoples to um, observe or rather 
document what they are observing, how the climate is changing, the impacts it's having on their livelihoods, on their communities, and uh, pooling that uh, information and also with scientific information in order to try to um, uh, reinforce the processes, uh, opportunities of adaptation. And then we have also been organizing global conferences uh, with at the COP21 and COP22 to share experiences from around the world in these types of efforts at the local level to bring together indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge uh, to co-produce knowledge and uh, reinforce the decision-making process uh, within the uh, UNFCCC. So maybe I'll stop there. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, it's very encouraging to be seeing the linkages between scientific knowledge and Indigenous uh, people's knowledge being brought together, and um, I hope we can look forward to seeing this as being a, uh, a feature in the upcoming IPCC reports, the special report on, on, on 1.5 and the, the upcoming other special reports and, and AR6. Um, uh, so, Yoti, UNDP. Um, projects and, uh, and programs all over the world, um, including um, many coming through with the Green Climate Fund at the moment, um, and UNDP has also had a very significant engagement with uh, Red Plus. Uh, it would be great to hear from you about your experiences, successes and challenges uh, associated with the engagement and participation um, of uh, Indigenous peoples and local communities. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, and I, uh, on behalf of UNDP, I'd like to thank the co-chair and uh, the substa chair and Grace, his co-moderator, for inviting us to participate here in this historic and um, historic an important event, multi-stakeholder dialogue, and we are very, very pleased and honoured to be here. Um, I do want to s emphasize at the outset, and as you've already heard from uh, Douglas, our UNESCO colleague, that uh, UNDP is just one of the UN organizations that's working with local communities and indigenous uh, peoples. As you can see from the number of submissions uh, that have been made by intergovernmental organizations to respond to the invitation made by the parties. Six, I think, at last count, and I'm, I'm sure they will be part of this after uh, the session after this. As Hindu has said, that this is a very small, uh, this is a short time, and we have to be brief, so we are doing a lot of things, but I just want to give you a sh small flavor of what we are doing, and we're very happy to continue this dialogue after the session, um, because um, we've only been given 10 minutes or less to speak. Um, as you know, UNDP has over 25 years of experience, mostly through our GEF Small Grants Program, uh, which is a grant-making body to the civil society. UNDP hosts it on behalf of the GEF, the Global Environment Facility. We make um, grants to NGOs, CBOs, and indigenous peoples. Um, we've done this in 129 countries since 1993, across all the Rio, three Rio conventions and with over 22,000 cumulative grants, so, small grants so far, and it's still going. Approximately 15% of FG, SGP grants are to indigenous peoples. Uh, we have tried to improve access to SGP through facilitated formats in local and ver vernacular languages, participatory videos, representatives of IPs and national steering committees responsible for grant selection and approval, as well as recent initiation of the SGP program for indigenous fellows. Four IP global fellows were announced at UNFCCC COP22 in Marrakesh in November 2016 and CBD COP13 in Mexico in December 2016. We have a global, global ICA support initiative delivered through the SGP support in support of the uh, CBD 2020 IT targets 11, protected and, cons and conserved areas, target 14, ecosystem services, and target 18, traditional knowledge. This is uh, through funding from BMUB International Climate Initiative, ICI of Germany. We have a community-based Red Plus program, which we have piloted in six UN Red countries worldwide. Uh, the majority of the uh, 
an example of our engagement with indigenous communities is that the majority of the, our uh, CBR grants in DRC, for example, went to indigenous hunter-gatherers in the Congo Basin. And we also have a collaboration with the National IPs platform, uh, R-E-P-A-L-E-A-C in DRC. Additional partnerships with the SGP as a delivery mechanism include community-based adaptation for all SIDS countries, um, as well as a 10 million Satoya, Satoyama Comdex initiative for social ecological resilience of production landscapes. Uh, the, there is also an SGP collaboration with UNU and UNESCO links, which uh, Douglas just talked about. Um, it's a program for valorization and recognition of uh, traditional knowledge. Um, and in this context, uh, and in the context of IPCC AR5, uh, we had organized a global conference in Mexico City in 2011 and the production of the Weathering Uncertainty Report. In our work in collaboration with the UN RED program, we support IP platforms in countries implementing their RED plus strategies or action plans. We also have RED plus platforms and commodity based platforms in some countries to which all stakeholders are invited to participate. We support countries to develop their Cancun safeguards on RED plus, which includes, as you all know, respecting the rights of indigenous peoples and communities. We have developed strict FPIC, free prior informed consent guidelines in keeping with the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And UNDP has developed our own environment and social safeguards and redress systems. We are happy to provide more information and or knowledge to the further development of this platform to support and, uh, and assist it in any way possible and to create synergies and collaborations with our own ongoing platforms. And happy to talk with anybody about more of our work with Indigenous peoples um, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Yoti. Um, so, in the uh, in the interest of time, um, I think we'll be uh, we we won't be opening the floor at this point for uh, comments that will come in uh, later. Um, I think uh, we have perhaps just begun to scratch the surface in terms of what's out there um, in relation to other similar or um, other sort of examples that can be drawn from for the work that is undertaken um, within this platform. And there's a wealth of experience at the national level um, as well to be bringing into the conversation. I think that the, um, the, the Red Plus experience in the Cancun safeguards was perhaps one of the turning points in the UNFCCC um, context uh, when it comes to, to engagement of Indigenous peoples. And so hearing about uh, experiences with Red Plus, I think in this conversation will be will also be very interesting. So I'll now um, hand the floor back over to Grace, who I understand will close the session. So thank you very much to our speakers. Um, and Grace, you now have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you very much to our panelists, Douglas, Juti, and Hindu. Uh, it, indeed, this session provided us uh, the existing experiences which will inform how we will also be setting up our indigenous peoples and local communities knowledge platform under the UNFCCC. So thank you very much. I now turn over to Carlos for the next session three. Thank you. Up here. Thank you. Sorry. Sure. 
Uh, thank you very much, Grace. We are now turning to session three. With this session at the heart of the dialogue, our intention is to reach a shared understanding of and elaborate on the possible functions, content, what the platform could do to fulfill its overall purpose laid out in decision 1 CP21, paragraph 135 of the Paris Agreement. As mentioned earlier, the Secretariat has received a large number of submissions that provided a broad variety of ideas that we can further discuss. To this effect, I would now like to invite the Secretariat to share with us the key elements contained in the submissions with regards to, to the proposed functions and content of the platform. I now hand it over to Regina to present it. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. It's going to get closer to the mic. Okay, it works. Um, building on uh, the Chair's opening remarks, um, I just want you to just uh, sort of cap where we are um, uh, at this uh, moment in terms of our steps towards operationalizing the platform. As uh, um, Substitute, in his opening remarks, he um, highlighted that we had received a number of submissions. So I'll, I'll provide an overview in my next slide. And uh, we are here uh, in Bonn uh, at the margin of SBs uh, on open uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue. And um, as also emphasized in his opening, uh, we will be uh, under the guidance of the substitute chair uh, putting together a report on the dialogue based on the discussions during the dialogue as well as the submission uh, we have received, which will inform the uh, discussion at the next SBs and recommendation to the COP in Bonn. Um, this provides a very quick overview in terms of the submission submissions uh, we have received, um, and this, um, is all, these submissions are all available on the website. Uh, we have received uh, six submissions from parties, uh, seven from intergovernmental organizations, uh, nine from uh, non-governmental organizations, and seven from uh, non-admitted organizations, total 29 submissions. Very impressive. And um, also a, a, a quick overview on that is the submissions provided a very rich um, content in terms of um, overarching purpose. Uh, various functions that platform um, can undertake in terms of uh, as a part of the operationalization and various uh, suggestions and views on the um, modality, structure and nature of uh, how the platform would, would look like. Um, as a secretary, as uh, uh, advised by the chair of SUBSTA, my attempt here is to provide uh, at a higher level um, uh, elements that have emerged from the submission. So it's by no means an exhaustive analysis of all the submission we have received. And I'll try to provide um, in my presentation in the subsequent slides uh, a key elements that have emerged from the submissions in terms of the key functions and some example that might help you to guide your thinking while you are making your uh, interventions in the dialogue. So the first function, uh, the possible function of the uh, platform seems to be a knowledge component, which, which basically um, the, the definition as we are trying to sort of um, explain what this means is based on what we have seen in the submission received uh, from parties, from IPOs, from other organizations, the knowledge uh, component, uh, a function component focuses on facilitating effective exchange of experiences and sharing of best practices, including through creating avenues uh, with the use of safeguards. And this is among and between indigenous peoples of the world and also between indigenous peoples, parties, and other knowledge systems uh, stakeholders. So I'm going to give you a couple of ideas that were expressed in the submission, and by no means these are not exhaustive. Um, the first one is uh, some of the possible uh, ideas around what this might look like is creating avenues for exchange of best practices and approaches for working with the 
uh, local indigenous knowledge, including the use of safeguards. Um, the other possible example that we have seen in the submission is facilitating information exchange and initiatives, national and international, between among indigenous peoples of the world and also between indigenous peoples, parties, and other stakeholders, which is aimed at strengthening the linkages to knowledge, technologies, practices, and efforts of um, communities and people and indigenous peoples to address climate change. And the third example, as an uh, example that um, was also um, uh, in the submission, was the facilitating information exchange with other processes outside the UNFCCC, for example, intergovernmental um, uh, panel on climate change, which was also highlighted in our discussion in the panel. And the second, um, second possible function, um, uh, a capacity building component. So what it, uh, what it could constitute is uh, this capacity building um, cluster could facilitate could build capacities of um, uh, indigenous peoples and local communities to effectively engage in the UNFCCC processes in terms of the relevant decisions and issues, uh, including supporting the implementation of Paris Agreement. So also let me give you some examples that were um, in the submissions to give uh, some more context to it. Um, so an idea was this will this function would facilitate building capacities um, of indigenous peoples and local communities to facilitate di direct engagement and participation within the UNFCCC processes and relevant work. Here there has been um, uh, references to various agenda items, work program that are relevant. For example, a technology mechanism, um, uh, Warsaw International Mechanism, loss and damage, Nairobi work program. Um, I probably won't be able to give you the exhaustive list, but these are some of the examples that were um, in the submission. And relevant work of the UNFCCC in the negotiating process and also in the constitutive bodies, um, and including in the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So, and this uh, capacity building is in a way that would uh, promote the inclusivity transparency of decision-making and actions in the context of UNFCCC process. And finally, the third cluster, climate change policies and actions. Um, so what it contains, essentially, uh, the ideas that uh, reflected in the submission, the ideas here would constitute um, facilitating integration of um, um, diverse knowledge systems, practices, innovations, and of the local communities and indigenous peoples, but also the engagement of them, uh, of the indigenous peoples and local communities into relevant climate change decisions and interventions, actions, programs, and policies at, at multiple levels. So give you a couple of uh, examples uh, that we have seen in the submissions. Uh, the first example uh, is uh, supporting national regional efforts to build synergies between the local and indigenous knowledge and science to inform climate change decision making. The second example uh, uh, which might support the function could be to facilitate international regional, which also includes South-South cooperation and uh, uh, to support um, indigenous peoples and local communities to apply their traditional knowledge and practices to climate action. And the third idea was to facilitate and enable the interaction of uh, uh, indigenous peoples' diverse knowledge systems, practices, innovations, uh, experiences into relevant climate change uh, decisions and interventions, again, at all levels, including at the national level. So as, as you can see, uh, uh, what we uh, made an at attempt uh, um, with the chair, sorry, it doesn't seem to work, um, is in, in a summary, seems to be the three uh, possible functions for the platform, knowledge, capacity for engagement, uh, climate change policies and action, and this by no means are um, independent functions. As you can see, we're trying to come up with a, a nice visual, um, so as to say that these are all interconnected, and as you can see in the visual, uh, the peoples are in the middle uh, with an idea that this is an inclusive and engagement process. Um, so I would like to end my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you, Regina, for this presentation, which also outlines the three clusters of functions that we, we would like to dialogue to address now, namely knowledge, 
climate change policies and actions, and capacity for engagement. Let me now turn to you, participants, and ask you to consider the questions that are also presented in the agenda. How to facilitate effective exchange of experiences and sharing of best practices, including through creating avenues and with the use of safeguards among and between indigenous peoples of the world, and also between indigenous peoples, parties, and other knowledge systems, stakeholders. How can the platform do this function to facilitate the integration of LCIP, diverse knowledge systems, practices, innovations, and experiences, and the engagement of LCIP into relevant climate change related decisions and interventions, actions, programs, and policies subject to LCIP's free, prior, and informed consent? How to build capacities of LCIP to effectively engage in relevant UNF, CCC, and other climate-related processes on relevant issues, including supporting the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We will dedicate the rest of our time today to addressing those questions that Grace and I think will help us elaborate the functions, what the platform could do to fulfill its purpose as outlined on the platform. While Grace and I don't mean to confine the dialogue to these questions, it is our assessment that the three clusters identified from the submissions capture all views. If you believe this is not the case, we will be happy to hear your views and address these additional items tomorrow when we resume our dialogue. In terms of organization, Grace and I have agreed that I would moderate this session today and that she will moderate tomorrow's sessions. So I would now like to uh, open the floor uh, for your considerations. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, as you're putting up your, floor, your flags, uh, please don't be hindered by not uh, having a good uh, grasp of English. We do have interpreters who can assist you in Spanish and French. Unofficial. Unofficial, but would be able to assist you uh, in French and Spanish. Uh, in addition, we might not be able to see flags all the way down to the back, so I'd ask you to please introduce yourselves when you make your intervention so we know uh, where you're from. Okay, certainly, I see the IPFCCC. Thank you very much. I'm uh, just going to address the question of the best practices on strengthening indigenous traditional knowledge on behalf of in International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-moderators, and I also would like to uh, congratulate the, the presenter that summarized the, uh, of the summations, and I think that is very well taken into account. Thank you very much. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to express our views in relation to best practices on strengthening indigenous traditional knowledge. We believe it is imperative to build upon the knowledge, science, and technologies of indigenous peoples. Advancing the revitalization of indigenous and traditional knowledge, strengthening indigenous approaches to research, development, and demonstration, promoting culturally appropriate development, and facilitating access to climate technology to development and transfer are issues of importance to us. The requirement of free, prior, and informed consent from the holders of such a knowledge, innovation, and practices is equally important and should be kept in mind. Um, Co-moderators, in order to strengthen the traditional knowledge of indigenous people, we urge parties to promote and recognize the sustainable community forest management practices of indigenous peoples. Indigenous communities, forest management strategies implemented by indigenous peoples include the establishment of sustainable community conservation areas and areas of for afforestation and river basin management, which contribute significantly to reversing the deforestation process. For example, Mr. Co-moderator, 
the Miskiti peoples of Nicaragua practices three different use of land, cultivated fields, grassland, and forests. The recent research done by Asian, Asian indigenous peoples, International Work for Indigenous Affairs, and United Nations Food and Agriculture has proved the shifting cultivation contributes to the food security, biodiversity enhancement, and well-being of, of millions of indigenous peoples. Traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples is based on their collective rights and their unique relationship with their lands and territories. The best way to strengthen indigenous people traditional knowledge and ensure its continued transmission is to ensure that the rights of indigenous people to their lands and territory is recognized and strengthened. The sharing and use of these indigenous people's traditional knowledge to others should be governed by principles of free prior informed consent. For example, indigenous people's traditional knowledge must be used responsible. Keeping, maintaining, and promoting indigenous people's traditional knowledge creates responsibility, and misuse of, it, of indigenous people's traditional knowledge can have catastrophic consequences for indigenous peoples. Co-moderators, financial support for indigenous people's traditional knowledge holders, in the process of informing them about the platform and its purpose, their interchange with each other and in the exchange of their knowledge with the parties, as well other future activity found necessary for the fair fulfillment of the purposes of the platform must also be provided. Finally, the local communities and indigenous peoples platform can facilitate the exchange of knowledge by providing resources for exchanges between indigenous peoples in the same ecosystem. For example, indigenous peoples in marine ecosystems, in the desert systems, and mountain systems. Thank you very much, commoderators. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite the CBD uh, to take the floor. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, and thank you, uh, co-moderator, delegates, representatives of indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, I'd like to also thank the three panelists who spoke before and raised um, a bit of awareness on how um, the Convention on Biological Diversity integrates the issues of all the concerns of indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, I also bring greetings to you from our team working on Article 8J. Um, the international community has recognized the contribution of traditional knowledge of traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities. I'll refer to them as IPLCs from now on in the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in the Convention on Biological Diversity, particularly in the preamble and on, in Article 8J on traditional knowledge and related provisions. A fundamental principle of the program of work on Article 8J of the Convention on Biological Diversity has been the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples and local communities in the work of the CBD. The principal mechanism of the full and effective participation of IPLCs is the ad hoc open-ended working group on Article 8J. This working group is open to all parties and indigenous peoples and local community representatives who play a full and active role in its work. IPLCs organizations can request accreditation to participate in the official meetings under the CBD as indigenous peoples or local communities organizations. There are also seats that are assigned for IPLCs during CBD meetings. Um, a as I mentioned, the fundamental principle of the work under Article AJ has been the participation of IPLCs in the work of the, work, the working group. So building on this, the success um, of the working group lies in the practices adopted to ensure the effective participation of IPLCs in the work. Um, this includes measures such as nomination of an indigenous co-chair to assist the chairperson of the meeting, um, 
a, a, a bureau of indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, we have the situation where um, IPLCs also co-chair sub-working groups and contact groups. Um, and also um, IPLCs have a special, uh, have the right to make um, um, submissions or, or, or um, make comments during the, the discussion of all agenda items. Additionally, to further assess the effective participation of IPLCs in the work of the convention, the Secretariat has established specific web pages and web page, uh, web-based tools, including the traditional knowledge information portal, and it facilitates regular capacity development efforts and manages a voluntary funding mechanism for the participation of IPLCs in meetings held under the convention. All in all, the work of the Secretariat to engage IPLCs is seen as a good practice model for the rest of the United Nations system. However, a challenge remains for achieving full integration of Article AJ and provisions related to IPLCs in the work of the Convention and its protocols with full and effective participation of IPLCs. Mainly, to what extent the practices for enhanced participation of IPLCs can be taken up by other subsidiary bodies and the COP itself. Thank you. I thank the Convention on Bi Biological Diversity for its uh, intervention. And while looking down there, I saw to your left that we have a representative of the incoming presidency of the COP. Madam Ambassador, welcome. I don't know if you'd like to uh, have any uh, statements. To go. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure having you here. I would then like to invite uh, another representative of the Indigenous Peoples, uh, Kimaren, to take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, co-moderator. And it's great to see the house almost full. It's an indication that uh, this dialogue has interest or interests all of us. And indeed, we look forward to a very productive and, uh, and uh, useful space here. I also want to appreciate that the opening remarks made by both the co-moderators and the executive secretary and the great inputs from the panelists and the very, I think, nuanced reflections of the submissions, which you also had a chance to see uh, submitted by the UNFCC secretariat. I am making this uh, statement on behalf of the International Indigenous People uh, Forum on Climate Change and firstly, as indigenous people, we really want to welcome the decision uh, by parties to establish this platform under paragraph 135, and specifically also note the twin goals of one, strengthening indigenous knowledge, and two, facilitating the exchange of this knowledge and experiences and good practice. Further, we as indigenous people envision the platform as an avenue to give meaning to the numerous UNFCC decisions related to indigenous people's interests and concerns, including, for example, the, the, the integration of indigenous people's rights, the issue of safeguards, which has been mentioned already, traditional knowledge, full and effective participation, community-based monitoring, and more importantly also, therefore, the linkage to, to other climate change, or rather other international process, such as the, the United Human Rights System, which we heard from Hindu, such as this, this, the CBD, we just heard from our colleague there, and the SDGs, which has integrated a number of elements that are of concern to indigenous people. We think the platform will serve to give meaning and advance these gains globally by indigenous people. Uh, third, indigenous people see the platform as a two-way avenue for exchanging this knowledge within and across all, uh, all climate change actors. Specifically, indigenous people look forward to showcasing concrete and meaningful strategies and approaches where indigenous people can contribute to the UNFCC work streams, including, for example, the adaptation needs assessment, the loss and damage, the capacity needs assessment, mitigation efforts and NDCs, which are part of the Paris Agreement. In order to achieve the objective of strengthening uh, indigenous and traditional and local knowledge systems, 
indigenous people call upon parties to the UNFCC to ensure that guidance and elements on application of traditional knowledge in climate adaptation and mitigation originating from the platform activities are fully integrated and operationalized by linking them with climate financing programs such as those under the Green Climate Fund. In terms of uh, the structure, because my, 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 my talk really is more of an overview of the indigenous people uh, submission, Madam Executive Secretary mentioned about the need to make this platform practical and effective and to, to serve the best interests of indigenous peoples by giving them a voice. We think the structures, we think about it even going to tomorrow, should go beyond the periodic open space of international uh, or this international space of exchange to creatively establish links within the UNFCC secretariat, the subsidiary bodies and the relevant work stream, including the COP, through a dedicated mechanisms supported by an indigenous people program within the UNFCC that will, for example, have a global body of indigenous people as we have had experiences here. We'll have maybe working groups that will generate this data from the ground, feeding the platform so that then the platform can have flesh and, 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 and issues of substance to transmit to the different work streams. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I see we have a representative of the of the UN of the Special, UN Representative. UN Special uh, Representative on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, with us. Madam, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, co-moderators. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, holding this uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue. Uh, I think it's really a crucial step towards the, the establishment of a platform that has been decided uh, by the Conference of Parties. Uh, first, I would like to, to talk about the issue of uh, knowledge. How do, you, how do we facilitate effective exchange of experiences? Uh, as we all know, uh, traditional knowledge is very context specific, and therefore it's very important to ensure that the knowledge uh, uh, sharing and uh, exchange really uh, happens from the local up to the global level. Uh, Indigenous peoples are the ones who, have, as we have seen in increasing uh, uh, research that is happening now, many evidences have emerged which shows that uh, several of the remaining uh, sustainably managed ecosystems are overlapping with indigenous peoples' territories. And this evidence also would show that for indigenous peoples' rights to their lands, territories, and resources are respected, that's also where we find these ecosystems which are in a better shape. So I think that such kinds of evidences which have been generated by uh, uh, scientific studies uh, will, will really tell us that if we, that, that there is an inextricable link between the respect for the rights of indigenous peoples and their capacities to be able to contribute to climate change mitigation adaptation as well as to disaster risk preparedness readiness and management so i think uh, uh, that this has to be be understood very well because uh, we we know that in, in situations where the rights are not respected and are grossly violated, the chances for indigenous peoples to contribute to such solutions will be lessened uh, significantly. The other uh, thing around uh, knowledge uh, sharing is also uh, the, the need to, to recognize that indigenous peoples don't necessarily document you know, or put into writing their own knowledge systems. These are knowledge systems that are transmitted from generation to generation, and these are supported through very uh, com uh, complex and intricate governance systems for traditional authorities, uh, women, you know, and uh, indigenous uh, knowledge holders are able to, to participate in terms of ensuring that rules developed by themselves are going to be uh, implemented. And I say this because I do come from a community where, where we have very strict rules governing forest management, governing soil, soil protection, etc. And this can only be 
uh, implemented if there are strong authorities within our communities that ensure that each and every member of the community are able to participate and do their roles as defined by such a governance system. So I think it's also important to know and understand how such governance systems are used and effectively uh, implemented. Uh, I think that the the long history of indigenous peoples being able to sustain their uh, their ecosystems is really very much related to also to how strong such governance systems continue to exist even amidst the imposition of modern governance systems. Uh, in in some cases they 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 work together. In some cases there are conflicts, and that's where some tensions happen. Uh, in terms of uh, community uh, of climate change policies and actions, uh, I think that for us to be able to integrate uh, indigenous knowledge into climate decisions, actions, and uh, and uh, programs, uh, there really needs to be much more work done in terms of ensuring that indigenous uh, knowledge uh, are also considered in the uh, nationally determined contributions that uh, countries developed. Uh, uh, I think it's important to see how really uh, the indigenous peoples at the national level are involved in developing these NDCs. And also when there are uh, national, you know, for, for instance, in funding matters for the national uh, designated authorities of the green climate funds are also able to ensure that indigenous peoples are able to have direct access to the funds for them to be able to strengthen their traditional uh, knowledge that supports the solutions for climate change. And uh, finally, in terms of capacity for engagement, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in a lot of cases, oral oral tradition is really what uh, what uh, uh, exists in many indigenous communities. There's really a lot of work that needs to be done to help build the capacities of indigenous peoples to document, to research and document their own knowledge systems, and to determine the kinds of, uh, for instance, if they are going to share this, what kinds of uh, equitable sharing arrangements are going to be made so that uh, they will they will have uh, uh, the possibility of not having their knowledge just appropriated, but really strengthened and reinforced for the sake of the goals that we are meeting, that we would like to meet. So these are just a few of the comments that I'd like to make for now. I would like to come back later on to also engage in the different uh, questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, uh, this uh, platform is to provide, or sorry, dialogue is to provide an exchange among the uh, indigenous peoples, organizations, parties. And so I'd then like to invite our, our first party uh, to take the floor and really to see we need some really concrete suggestions of how we are moving uh, this issue forward. And uh, one of the issues, for example, just mentioned was uh, the NDCs and how the indigenous peoples can contribute towards that. So indeed, we may need to see how we can get everyone to recognize the platform and how we promote its use among everyone so that that becomes a way of exchanging information uh, back and forth. So the European Union, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, uh, co-facilitator. And let me say that this is a, that it's a real pleasure to, to participate in this dialogue and, and we see that this room is very full and that there is a, a lot of interest uh, in this subject. The EU is committed to this dialogue and uh, will also be, be, let's say, engaging in this dialogue uh, in the run-up to, to the COP uh, session, also if this, this, this formal session is closed. The EU welcomes the agreement reached in Marrakesh on the incremental approach to developing the local communities and indigenous peoples platform with a view to ensuring its eff effective and timely operationalization. This multi-stakeholder dialogue is a major first step in this incremental approach. The EU is committed to engage actively in this multi-stakeholder multi dialogue, which is an opportunity for parties and representatives of local communities and indigenous peoples and other stakeholders to explain proposals and explore convergence. We hope that the report of this dialogue will be a good basis to make a very concrete step that operationalizes the platform at COP23. We welcome the innovative way of organizing the multi-stakeholder dialogue in conjunction with SB46, co-moderated by the, by the sub chair and a representative of indigenous peoples organizations. In the EU's view, 
the establishment of the platform needs to be seen in the broader context of first the recent evolution of the involvement and participation of indigenous peoples in the united nations following the 2014 World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. The EU engages constructively in the consultations that take place in New York on that matter. Secondly, it needs to be seen also in the context of the overall dynamics under the UNFCCC to further enhance the effective engagement of non-party stakeholders with a view to strengthening the implementations of the provisions of Decision 1 CP21. And thirdly, uh, and importantly, the acknowledgement in the Paris Agreement that parties, when, take, when taking action to combat climate change, should respect, promote and consider their respective obligations on human rights, in particular the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. In that context, the EU reaffirms its commitment to promote and protect the rights of indigenous peoples. We recall our support to the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples, at the UN General Assembly in 2007 and, and our support for the outcome document of the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples held in 2014 as a high plenary of the UN General Assembly, including and in particular its paragraph 36 that confirms that Indigenous peoples' knowledge and strategies to sustain their environment should be respected and taken into account when states develop national and international approaches to climate change mitigation and adaptation. We had initial discussions inside the EU that led to our submission. It sets out a broad view on the, board, on the boundaries for the discussion on this platform. We are here to listen to the proposals by parties, representatives of local communities and indigenous peoples and other stakeholders, which will help us in further internal discussion on the refinement of our position in the run-up to COP23. We welcome the capture of convergence arising from the submissions in three clusters, uh, as presented by the Secretariat, related to knowledge, knowledge exchange, which will contribute to, secondly, a better integration of this knowledge and strategies in the development of national and international approaches to climate change mitigation and adaptation. And thirdly, we acknowledge that therefore there is a need for capacity building amongst local communities, indigenous peoples, and also parties. And just making use of, of this opportunity to, to inform you that uh, maybe not all of you know that yesterday in the conclusions, uh, in the Substa conclusions on agenda item on research and systematic observation, uh, there, was, uh, there is a reference to traditional knowledge and indigenous peoples, which can be a basis for, for uh, let's say, for this dialogue and for this, this, this looking for the synergies as, as presented in the, in the intervention by uh, uh, Douglas. Then continuing, in the EU's view, the uh, local communities and the indigenous peoples platform could be the interface between, firstly, representative uh, local communities and indigenous peoples institutions and parties. Secondly, again, uh, indigenous peoples and local communities and bodies and processes under the UNFCCC. And thirdly, between local communities and indigenous peoples institutions and relevant UN organizations. We believe that this also will be helpful in implementing the existing mandates, which are, are several already, related to local communities and indigenous peoples and traditional knowledge under the UNFCCC. This all needs to be done in such a way that facilitates that parties, when taking action to address climate change, respect, promote, their respective obligations on human rights and in this context, in particular, the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. The EU is open to exploring proposals in this regard, but stresses that it, this should aim at enhancing synergies and coherence with other multilateral agreement and avoid duplication. The EU is committed to operationalize the local communities and indigenous peoples platform in an effective and timely way. It should be guided by some prim principles and we'll need to address some important challenges. We think that this, this is not an easy task. Therefore, we consider it is important to build upon relevant experiences under the UNFCCC and to learn from experiences in other multilateral contexts. And so we are most grateful for the input we received uh, uh, from these other experiences uh, at the beginning of the session. 
Finally, the resource implications associated with the operationalization of the platform will be, become more clear as our discussions evolve. However, however, we understand that there will be resource implications and some need for support by the Secretariat. To the best of our knowledge, some parties have already contributed to enable in informal work in the context of the operationalization of the platform and to facilitate the participa participation of representatives of indigenous peoples in this very dialogue. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gert. On behalf of the EU, I would now like to uh, pass the floor back to another representative of the indigenous peoples, and I recognize the gentleman. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a reflection really on what's transpired so far, and I, I think we would like a reaction from the states or parties particularly, but others, with regard to our participation, that is, as the International Indigenous Peoples uh, Forum on Climate Change, and in addition, uh, our traditional knowledge holders. I think to begin with, uh, it's been somewhat gratifying to see that there are institutions or UN bodies that actually do feel that they have fully uh, accounted for the full participation of indigenous peoples. And to that, we would add the requirement of free prior informed consent uh, as, uh, as called for by the preambles to both the decision and, uh, and, and the uh, Paris Agreement. Our right to full and effective participation in all aspects of the forum include decision making through representatives chosen by us in accordance with our own procedures. And that should be recognized as well as transparency and free and prior informed consent. We, we, we understand that this is a state driven process, but it's also interesting to note that, that throughout the state driven state owned process, really, although we would like to take ownership, we want our indigenous, uh, traditional office, office uh, traditional knowledge holders to take ownership of that process when it's time, when this, this uh, platform is affected. But, um, so we, we need that, that, that is a challenging task, I know, but I think that there are sufficient examples of indigenous people's participation where in fact the right of free power informed consent is in fact recognized that uh, uh, I hope will be part of the process. The second item that really is a primordial concern to us is uh, adequate funding as the uh, European, distinguished European uh, Union representative established. We have a really a two-stage process. Now we're in the process of implementation. And we want to ensure that all indigenous peoples, all indigenous peoples regions are represented. I'm not sure that people understand that we have no Pacific representative attending this session because they could not raise the funding. And yet, Fiji is going to be the next COP president. And so we, we see that as a failure and we, we hope that there's full, uh, there is a timely and effective funding for us, not only for the COP23, but thereafter, so that in implementing this, uh, this platform, the whole panoply of environments, the uh, whole panoply of, uh, of uh, traditional knowledge is explored. And then we get to the stage once implementation that the participation and capacity building and all the things that are program of traditional office holders of excuse me traditional knowledge holders uh is fully implemented and they become owners of the process to to the extent that is possible but certainly they will also have their rights respected in that expense so those are the considerations uh, i really would be interested in hearing state parties uh uh reflections on thank you very much uh, thank you very much uh, for your suggestions and indeed your questions. Uh, so may I now turn the floor to New Zealand? Kia ora koutou katoa. Good morning. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank the Chair and the um, moderator Grace and the representatives of the Indigenous Peoples here today. Um, I would like to also acknowledge the presence of my colleague Maria Nepia, who is here representing the Climate Change Emily Leaders Group from New Zealand. Um, it's a great honour for me to deliver this statement on behalf of New, Zealand, New Zealand's government today to express our support for the local communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform and to provide some of our views on it. We support the platform's aim of giving Indigenous peoples and local communities an active role in helping to shape climate change active action 
and also as a permanent forum to discuss Indigenous people's climate change issues. We believe the platform should have a clear and meaningful function that will achieve practical and pragmatic outcomes for Indigenous people. This view is based on New Zealand's, the New Zealand government's experience of partnership with Māori under Te Tiriti o Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi. Over the last decade, the New Zealand government has seen the benefits of working with Māori on natural resource issues. We en engage with the iwi leaders groups on a number of environmental areas, including climate change, recognising the uni unique relationship Māori have with the environment and the opportunities a Māori perspective provides for better environmental and economic outcomes for all New Zealanders. A climate change strategic relationship agreement governs this engagement and was initiated when we re recognised the mutual value added by a close working relationship with iwi leaders groups. Māori, like other Indigenous peoples, will be affected by climate change as well as by the policies framed to address climate change impacts. Therefore, input by our, our Indigenous people into the development of policies and strategies is critical. The platform provides the opportunity, opportunity to go beyond New Zealand's domestic work on the issue and share insights with and receive insights from members of the platform. Therefore, we support the platform facilitating parties learning from Indigenous people's traditional knowledge to create a better climate, out chain, climate change outcomes for all. We look forward to hearing others' views and, we, and seeing the platform deliver. Thank you. Uh, thank you, New Zealand. I would now like to turn the floor back over to another representative of the Indigenous Peoples of uh, uh, Youth. Uh, yes, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. I am Maitin Yumon, working with Chin Human Rights Organization and Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. I'm very honored to speak on behalf of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change at this dialogue. And it is my privilege to convey the views of Indigenous youths and women. First of all, the IPFCC appreciates state party support in operationalizing the indigenous people's traditional knowledge platform. We expect your continued support as part of your commitment to the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We acknowledge the recognition given by the UNFCCC to the important role of traditional knowledge in climate change related actions. As indigenous youth and indigenous women are particularly at risk to the impacts of climate change and loss of traditional knowledge, we require special measures and targeted attention. We, indigenous women, are key knowledge holders as we play a vital role in ensuring food security, the livelihood of our communities, and biodiversity conservation and enhancement. This is done through the continuous practice and development of indigenous knowledge cultivated and transmitted through generations. As indigenous youth, sorry. The youth are also important in ensuring the continued practice and development of traditional knowledge. We work with our communities to revitalize, strengthen, and preserve traditional knowledge, not only as our cultural duty, but because we recognize the, uh, the, its benefits for all peoples, indigenous and non-indigenous. Our knowledge on modern technology and social media can be a source in safeguarding traditional knowledge from misappropriation. The importance of enhancing and preserving traditional knowledge cannot be overstated. The crucial role of indigenous youths and women in this process must be strengthened and respected. Hence, we make the following recommendations. Parties must recognize the important role of and rights of indigenous youth, indigenous women, and traditional knowledge holders to maintain, protect, and develop their cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions and intellectual property, so as to protect from misappropriation or misuse of our traditional knowledge. Parties must recognize and support the rights of indigenous peoples to ensure effective intergenerational transfer of our traditional knowledge. We strongly urge all the stakeholders to ensure that the whole platform 
acknowledge and prioritize the roles and contributions of indigenous women as knowledge holders and of indigenous youths as crucial to the intergenerational transfer of traditional knowledge in the overall discussion of indigenous people's platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contribution. May I now turn to another party and ask uh, Ecuador to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. As this is the first time I'm taking the floor, let me first congratulate indigenous peoples and local communities on this important achievement in the context of the UNFCCC. As Ecuador, we look forward for the effective operationalization of the local communities and indigenous peoples platform. As we all know, indigenous peoples and local communities have an outstanding role in the protection of Mother Earth recognizing that they are also particularly vulnerable to climate change. In order to facilitate an effective exchange and sharing of best practices, we believe we need to strengthen indigenous approaches to research, development, and demonstration, promote cultural appropriate development in a holistic, balanced, and integrated manner. Effective experiences should not reflect only the positive side of it, but also the challenges and constraints so as to find ways together to overcome them. These experiences and practices should include the promotion of development in harmony with nature. To improve the creation of avenues among indigenous peoples of the world and other knowledge systems, a permanent fluid communication should be established between parties and representatives of the indigenous peoples and local communities with the basis of the work that should be the recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples as well as the rights of nature. As indigenous peoples are the keepers of Mother Earth resources, we believe the priorities identified by local communities and indigenous peoples to address climate change should be reflected. Finally, Mr. Commoderator, we suggest the confirmation of an open ad hoc working group under the SAPSTA in order to develop the structure of the platform, its modalities and procedures. I could give further details on its future mandate. The platform could also benefit from an expert advisory group involving, for example, but not limited to, the Special Rapporteur on United Nations Convention on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as well as other recognized experts in indigenous local development and climate change. However, it is essential to ensure that these participations don't represent limitations in logistical, budgetary, or technical support for actors for, from local communities and indigenous peoples. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a very concrete uh, suggestion, uh, Ecuador. Um, to ensure that we capture the rich uh, knowledge that we're gaining here today, may I invite those uh, who have already um, delivered statements, if they could please provide a copy to us, and those who will also be giving statements could also provide copies to us, that way we can capture that rich uh, information that you are um, uh, uh, delivering orally right now. May I now turn uh, to Canada? Uh, I want to thank the co-moderators, Presidency and Secretariat for making this dialogue possible today. Making progress in advancing and operationalizing the platform in a way that enhances the engagement of local communities and indigenous peoples in climate policy and in the work of the UNFCCC is a priority for the Government of Canada. To this end, I'm very pleased that the Canadian delegation today includes six representatives from Indigenous organizations in Canada. The Government of Canada views that Indigenous peoples must be an equal participant and self-represented in the platform. I speak here on behalf of the Government of Canada, but my other colleagues um, behind the flag uh, will speak on their own behalf, and they will no doubt be active contributors to this discussion, and following my intervention here, I would like to turn to my colleague from the Assembly of First Nations to speak as well. So briefly, I want to make two um, comments before turning over to my colleague. First, the importance of the platform in providing grassroots local communities and Indigenous peoples with a rightful voice in the work of the UNFCCC reflects how, according to the Canadian Constitution, Indigenous peoples are not just stakeholders, but rights right holders. 
And I might add that the Government of Canada recognizes the importance and is committed to implementing UNDRIP in its entirety. From coast to coast to coast in Canada, Indigenous peoples are seeing their livelihoods significantly affected by a warming climate, which makes their voice in our work today and the platform critical. They've also shown climate leadership long before the Paris Agreement. They have a unique relationship with government and they have experiences and traditional knowledge that must contribute to climate policy. Canada developed our domestic plan to meet our Paris target in consultation with Indigenous peoples and in implementing that plan, we have both established and recognized the need to continue to improve on a collaborative approach with them. Implementation also recognizes that the capacity of Indigenous peoples to meaningfully engage is an important issue. To that end, the platform that we're discussing today should be an ongoing endeavor to support the implementation of the Paris Agreement. It should, among other things, serve to share the experiences amongst parties and Indigenous peoples and on coming together to share knowledge and views to inform climate policy and climate actions going forward. We can learn from each other and we need to learn from each other. Secondly, we agree that the platform should be much more than an event or, or a website for the respectful exchange and consideration of traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge is of course an important, um, is of course important within the work of the UNFCCC but so is the broader concept of needing to enhance the interconnectedness between traditional knowledge, other knowledge systems, the views and experiences of local communities and Indigenous peoples, and the policy deliberations by parties and non-parties more broadly under the UNFCCC. To put it more succinctly, we're committed to the platform serving to enhance the direct interaction between parties and local communities and Indigenous peoples. So to conclude, the Government of Canada is keen to hear from and understand the views from all participants as part of this dialogue with an open mind in wanting to understand the options participants wish to consider for the purpose, content and structure of the platform. And if you'll permit me, um, I would like to turn to my colleague from the Assembly of First Nations. Uh, sir, you have the floor. Uh, I embrace uh, and welcome Canada's capacity to help us in, the, in this climate crisis that we're in. I, uh, the platform that uh, questions and issues that are before us is real to us. I want to encourage uh, my brothers and sisters, the Indigenous Nations peoples to, uh, to really work together in advancing what is happening to our territories lands and waters. I lead the Elders Council on AFN, on climate change and the environment. We see this, what is happening to our world is, it is a crisis. Time is not on our side. We know that what is happening that's affecting and impacting the lives of our people. Just recently, the prophecies that were foretold in the past have just come to pass. Just recently, in the Yukon, a river has changed its course. By that, I mean that the river is now flowing the other, the opposite direction. And that's a prophecy that was foretold some time ago. And that is now unfolding right before our very eyes. This urgency that I speak of 
is so important, vitally important to our, our nations, that our people, the survival of our civilization needs to be addressed seriously. And this platform that is discussion, the issues before us, is just one central piece of a bigger picture that's unfolding. The question before us as indigenous people, after we have brought forward these questions, where do we bring this, these questions to? As Canada said, Canada do not speak for the indigenous people, do not speak for indigenous people in Canada. At the end of the day, we need to bring this forth to a forum. And where do we go with that? That's the question I think indigenous people will need to answer that and work together on that. It's uh, back home in the north where I come from, in the far north, the north, what, what we call the north door. I just come from a meeting up there that still, there is still snow and ice. But in the rest of the world, in the south, it's flooding. So it's very, it is, we are in difficult time. And we need to work as a people to really move ahead. We need action. We not, we can't just talk about this crisis. We need to provide action. And Canada, I want to thank Canada for stepping up to the plate and, and helping to advance the climate change. And I want to thank them. And I, I just wanted to say this piece. I know we have the next day and a half, so thank you so much. Thank you very much for bringing your concerns to the dialogue. And I'm certainly a platform indeed will take uh, those on board. Thank you very much. May I not uh, ask Antigan Babuda to take the floor? Good morning. My name is Ruth Spencer. I'm fortunate to be here as the IPLC delegate on the government's delegation. So I have the best of both worlds. I can share what the government is doing. First of all, the Caribbean is underrepresented at most of the meetings that the government allows me to participate in. There are 14 islands in the Caribbean and I'm not seeing no representative from IPLC representative from any of the other islands. And so I have to seek to be a voice to speak on behalf of the Caribbean. Our government has passed legislation in 2015 that mandates that the IPLC is be represented on all national committees. So no policy is gonna pass without their input. We are very, we are very proactive island because what's been happening is that the community groups, they have ideas how they can help to solve some of the problems, meet the targets, but they have to be given an opportunity to have that involvement and participation. And so by having this law passed, and this law was actually passed by these same groups who went to parliament. For 10 years, there was no law on the books and things were just getting out of hand. You see things taking place in our communities, mangroves being cut, trees being cut. But when you make reports, if there's no law, what's gonna happen? So we got this law into parliament, and I'm telling you, we are very, very active. Not only at national level, regional, international level. We are active in the CBD on Article 8. We have a lot of input. At the last convention, we had, we went author into the booklet that came out. We are active also in the ABS, now yoga protocol where our groups have been identified as contact points for the country. We attended the IPBS meeting and we are ensuring to have our knowledge 
and our experiences be shared in the platform. I'd like to thank some of the parties here for their support to our projects within the Caribbean region, New Zealand, very active supporting us, Canada, Australia, and Germany. Your ambassadors come to the island, and after they meet with the governments, they want to come out to the local the communities. They want to see what's happening. And as a result of that, we have been able to get these groups legally registered. Because if you just remain as a local group, if you're now not legally registered, you really don't have that say so. To empower the groups, we assist them in getting registered, writing their proposals, submitting it to the government's uh, machinery, because in the law, there's 15% 15 fund, 15 funding allocated for the IPLC. So Antigua is a good role model, and I would encourage parties, when you have such organizations from the local communities on your team, you get things done. Because when you're from a small island with a small government, you don't have all the skills and expertise. They're out there in the communities, in our churches. And these people, these agencies want to contribute to the process. So for local buy-in, local ownership, I would advocate, I would encourage parties to support your groups, bring them into the process, and together we can reach the targets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antigua and Barbuda, for sharing uh, that information. And I seem, it seems the platform is already working. May I now invite uh, Norway to take the floor? Thank you. We appreciate the chance to give a few short remarks. We would like to emphasize that we think traditional knowledge system and a holistic vision of community and environment are key resources for global mitigation and adaptation to climate change. In the work that we have carried out in partnership with tropical forest countries, we have seen again and again that the best results come when indigenous peoples have been included and have taken the lead. Norway sees great importance in having a space where indigenous peoples and non-party stakeholders can share their valuable contributions. This workshop is a good first step to share initial views and we believe that the platform needs to be developed in a carefully considered way to ensure the best outcomes. We would also like to underline that in developing the platform, we learn from other experiences from other fora. The platform should be meaningful with a clear purpose and should be established in a way that can usefully inform existing mandates, for example, relationship to the action agenda, PCCP, PCCB and so forth. We look for further to hearing other, others' views and working with you on this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norway. I see we have another international organization among us, and so I'd like to invite the IUCN to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Sandeep Sengupta, representing the International Union for Conservation of Nature. IUCN welcomes very much the opportunity to participate in this historic meeting Calling for the respect for and, and support of indigenous peoples' rights has long been a prominent feature of IUCN's work and policies. Most recently, as some of you may know, at the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii, which is the highest governing body of our union that brings together our 1,400 state and non-governmental organization members, IUCN and its voters and its members voted to create a new category of membership for indigenous people's organizations within IUCN's institutional structure. We believe that taking into account the views of local communities and indigenous peoples is of vital importance in the context of climate change. Not only are indigenous peoples and local communities at the front line of climate impacts today, but they also have a vital contribution to make in terms of advancing practical nature-based solutions, which is a core focus of our work. Recent research suggests that about a quarter of the carbon stored above ground in the world's tropical forests is presently found in the collectively managed territories of indigenous peoples and local communities. Hence, it is critical in our view that there is a space created to take into account the, the indigenous and traditional knowledge of local communities and indigenous peoples to build their capacities and to find a way of feeding the very important work that they're doing into international 
and national level climate change policies and actions. We very much welcome that this platform has been created to enable such an exchange to happen. And in our submission, we have provided some suggestions on how this may work. And we look forward to continue remaining engaged in this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for intervention. I see we have another representative of the indigenous peoples. And I'd like to invite Saudata Burkina to take the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. I'm Saudata Abu Bakrin from Burkina Faso delegation. Thanks to my country for inclusion of civil society, local community, including pastoralist communities representative in the country's delegation. I come from a national platform on environment and red, red plus from Burkina Faso and from Sahel Pastoralist Woman Organization, who is Tin Hinan, and a number of African network, IPN, IIN, who include Mpokot, Masai, and other, SEMA, Congre Mondial, Amazir, Imazir, and Mozop, Ogonis, Foundation, Batwa, Pygmies, Twas. I support my brother and, and sister of International Forum for Indigenous People in the UNFCC. Sister and brother for gender constituency and local communities. Mr. Moderator, to answer facilitation of effective exchange and experiences and the best practice within the IPs and local community platform between indigenous people, local community of the world, and also between IPs, communities, parties, and other knowledge system stakeholders. We recommend to ensure full and effective participation of local community, indigenous women, young people, and elder, elders within UNFCC framework. I will give you an example from Africa. We said in French, in Africa, chaque vieillard qui meurt est une bibliothèque qui brûle, d'après uh, Amadou Sheikh Ampateba. Indigenous women and local communities have an instrumental role to play in climate change adaptation and mitigation and have a wealth of traditional knowledge and practices in achieving the goal of convention, including NDC's process at, at the national, regional and international level. There are many full, uh, full and effective participation in decision making and natural resource management should be ensured. The participation of indigenous women, elders and young people will strengthen the gender action plan in their UNFCC in enhancing knowledge generation and gender responsive implementation of climate change. We also recommend to strengthen participation of French speaker IPs, uh, indigenous people and local community, open dialogue communication system by facilitation uh, uh, and translation interpretation in all UN language and also in, all, in uh, our own IPs and local community language. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much for your contribution. I would now like to invite Costa Rica to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Good, good morning, colleagues. Uh, the Paris Agreement explicitly recognizes the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities in the context of climate action. As a country, Costa Rica included an explicit commitment to ensure human rights and gender equity in climate action. The respect of free, prior, and informed consent for indigenous peoples and local communities is also included as a principle in our national determined contribution. We have recently engaged with our indigenous peoples on issues related to reducing emissions from, 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 from deforestation and agreed on a common approach to advance in this area on the basis of specific issues identified by our indigenous peoples. In Marrakech, we also agreed on next step for developing a platform to exchange knowledge and experiences for addressing climate change. Developing this knowledge platform for indigenous peoples and local communities 
is a first step in the recognition of the fact that both, both groups of constituencies can actively and positively contribute with solutions to address the challenges of climate change. With the prior, with the prior consent, engagement and leadership of knowledge holders, the, platmer, the platform will make indigenous peoples and local communities knowledge available for all countries, communities and other actors to promote climate action deriving from the traditional knowledge. The platform will also contribute to better informed decision making from the national to international scales, in particular to take on board the specific needs and vulnerabilities of these groups. In this regard, the platform should facilitate increased engagement of indigenous people and local communities within the UNFCCC negotiations and processes by providing formal opportunities for the IPLC's diverse knowledge, best practices, <clears throat> experiences and perspectives to guide climate-related decisions and action at the national and international level. In establishing the platform, the UNFCCC should also facilitate the creation of a kind of coordination mechanism to assist in developing and presenting recommendations for consideration at the COP and the meeting of the subsidiary bodies on relevant matters through proper communication channels. The platform should, should inter alia establish and oversee the management of a web-based web platform for knowledge exchange where indigenous peoples can freely exchange information and knowledge related to climate change actions and ensure that the sharing of knowledge is done with the full consent of indigenous knowledge holders and is, re and is respectful of the cultural norms associated with such, such knowledge. We look forward to continue working in advance with the required arrangement for the consolidation of this platform, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Costa Rica, for your intervention. I see we have another UN agency with us, and I so invite the Office of the High Commissioner for Refuge Human Rights to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Ben Schachter with the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and we welcome the opportunity to contribute to this uh, important dialogue. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, indigenous local and traditional knowledge systems and practices including indigenous people's holistic view of community and environment are a major resource for adapting to climate change. By empowering indigenous peoples and local communities and guaranteeing them control over their traditional knowledge, lands, territories, and resources, as called for in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, states can simultaneously improve climate mitigation and adaptation efforts and the situation of indigenous peoples. The local communities and indigenous peoples knowledge platform should strengthen the connection of local communities and indigenous peoples with international climate action at the UNFCCC while protecting indigenous peoples rights and those of local communities. The UNDRIP articulates the collective and individual rights of indigenous peoples, including their right to effective, meaningful and informed participation in matters that affect them. It explicitly recognizes indigenous people's rights to maintain, control, protect, and develop their cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions, sciences, technologies, and cultures. The outcome of the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples also recognized the importance of the participation of indigenous peoples wherever possible in the benefits of their knowledge, innovations, and practices. The ongoing consultation process on Indigenous peoples' participation at the UN under the direction of the President of the General Assembly highlights the need for additional efforts to ensure the right to participation of Indigenous peoples in processes that affect them at all levels of governance. It is integral to protecting the rights of local communities and Indigenous peoples in climate action that they be empowered to contribute to the formulation and implementation of action to mitigate and adapt to climate change and that such actions respect, promote, and consider the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples. The knowledge platform must therefore respect indigenous peoples' rights to meaningfully participate in climate action that affects them and to maintain, control, protect, and develop their traditional knowledge. Actions that may impact these rights should not be taken without the free, prior, and informed consent of indigenous peoples. 
Given these human rights obligations and the purpose of the platform, OHCHR considers that the following could be amongst the key functions of the platform. To provide advice to the CUP based on local communities and indigenous people's traditional knowledge, best practices, and technologies. To facilitate effective, meaningful, and informed participation of local communities and indigenous peoples in climate action. To protect the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples to their traditional knowledge while promoting more effective climate action. To support local communities and indigenous peoples' capacity building for climate action and to link the work of existing UN mechanisms, such as the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to UNFCCC processes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, as I had indicated before, um, you had a very um, rich suggestions there. Kindly provide us uh, your statement to us so we can capture that also. And to anyone else who has already provided uh, any statements, please provide uh, copies of it uh, for us. May I now invite Australia to take the floor? Uh, thank you to the chair. And I'm very surprised and impressed that you can see my flag um, from this far back. So thank you. Um, good afternoon to all. Australia very much welcomes the opportunity to participate in this dialogue on the operationalization of the local communities and Indigenous peoples platform. Uh, we were really pleased to make a submission on this item, which I believe was sufficiently captured by the presentation that was given this morning. Um, so thank you very much for making that presentation. Uh, as we have heard this morning, the international community has recognised the unique situation of Indigenous peoples by adopting the Paris Agreement and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The Indigenous Peoples Platform could support the collective rights enshrined in the Declaration, including to self-determination and free, prior and informed consent. Indigenous local and traditional knowledge systems and practices, including Indigenous people's views of community and environment, are incredibly important resources for adaptation and mitigation to climate change. This unique knowledge is highly valuable and in Australia's view, the platform should be used as a mechanism to help inform climate related decision making at the UNFCCC and allow for a fruitful exchange and sharing of lessons and experiences in the most effective way. Australia's First Peoples are one of the oldest living cultures on earth and are a core part of Australia's identity. Indigenous peoples are directly affected by climate change and have a valuable contribution to make to the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We are strongly supportive and encouraging to have an avenue under the UNFCCC where Indigenous peoples can do so. We should take into account the very useful information that we've been presented with this morning from Hindu and from other UN representatives. It's been really useful to hear an overview of what's existing. And as we look to operationalize this platform, we should really harness this information and ensure that the platform complements these other processes. So just to close by saying that we really look forward to learning from others both today and tomorrow. And um, we will be here with open ears uh, to hear from you all about how we can best take this platform forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I now invite Bolivia to take the floor? Uh, Thank you, co-facilitators or co-moderators. Um, the plurinational state of Bolivia thank thanks to the resolve of its indigenous peoples, have actively supported and catalyzed the participation of indigenous peoples and local communities in national and global politics, especially in the crucial issue that represents climate change. For example, including the World People's Conference on Climate Change and Mother Earth Rights and other ongoing initiatives. We are actively involved in all possible ways of strengthening the participation of indigenous peoples. Just as an example, at the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, our country proposed a plural understanding of the relationship between peoples and the rest of Mother Earth. But more importantly, we proposed the establishment of a participatory mechanism for indigenous and local knowledge systems that will help to facilitate 
the linkages between indigenous and local communities and scientists. Bolivia and other parties in response to the request of indigenous people's organizations have been supporting the creation of a platform where these actors are adequately taken into account on UNFCCC decision-making processes and implementation. Today, the dear participants of the dialogue, we are present at, the, at this important event in representation of our first indigenous head of state, President, President Evo Morales Aima, in order to pledge our continued support to, the crucial, to this crucial process and to the operas, operationalization of the local communities and indigenous peoples platform. For the plurinational state of Bolivia, indigenous peoples are not just an important constituency. Indigenous peoples are the soul of the democratic revolution happening in Bolivia. Consequently, our long-standing position on climate change has involved the search for solutions to the structural causes of climate change by rejecting capitalism and restoring harmony within Mother Earth. For this reason, we, be, we firmly, firmly believe that the holistic and equitable perspective of mitigation and adaptation to address climate change will only be possible through two approaches. First, the meaningful intercultural knowledge exchange among indigenous peoples and local communities of the world. This exchange should bring together the brightest indigenous expertise on territorial land and water governance and harmonious management of nature's benefit to, benefits to people. Second, the horizontal interscientific dialogue between traditional local and indigenous knowledge systems on one hand and the established science um, or the established scientific knowledge systems on the other. These interscientific dialogues should start recognizing the equal validity and comple complementarity of modern Western sciences and local traditional and, and indigenous knowledge in the context of climate change, especially. Therefore, as for the purpose of the platform, it should be established as a space of reciprocal exchange among its participants and between them and parties and parties to enhance mitigation and adaptation with the following goals. Strengthening knowledge, technologies, practices, and efforts of local communities and indigenous peoples related to addressing and responding to climate change. Encouraging the exchange of experiences related to climate change among local communities and indigenous peoples of the world. Facilitating sharing of best practices on addressing mitigation and adaptation in a holistic and integrated manner between indigenous peoples and parties. Catalyzing collaboration between knowledge systems for the co-production of joint, more innovative, sustainable, and effective solutions that both mitigate climate change and enhance local resilience. Articulating worldviews of indigenous peoples and the vision of parties to adequately inform climate change decisions policies and actions from the perspective of peoples, of indigenous peoples, with the necessary capacity building, finance and technology support under the convention. Uh, uh, thank you very much, co-moderators. Thank you, Bolivia. We have a representative from WGC uh, among us and would like to take the floor. Could I ask the uh, individual to identify themselves and the organization. You have the floor. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. WGC is the Women and Gender Constituency. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm taking the floor uh, in the name of the Women and Gender Constituency to support the creation of the indigenous platforms and also in the name of WECF member of the Women and Gender Constituency uh, to recall an initiative that was taken in Marrakesh that could serve uh, this platform. Uh, so the Women and Gender Constituency supported the creation of the uh, indigenous platform through a common submissions that uh, you have received with other uh, constituencies. And we, in particular, uh, would like, uh, we really welcome these initiatives, in, in particular, as we have heard from other uh, previous statements, the importance to recognize the specific knowledge of indigenous women 
and the rights uh, recognized as customer customary rights by communities. Uh, and as I explained, as WECF and together with two other American um, uh, NGOs, a foundation and a network of um, uh, American professional women and political uh, elected women, we launched in uh, Marrakesh a global platform or a global alliance, uh, more exactly say, to support the preservation of traditional knowledge in linkage with the convention uh, of 2003 of the UNESCO Convention, convention on Intangible Cultural Inheritage. Uh, the purpose of this alliance is to also for, uh, strengthen exchange of experience and support the preservation of threatened uh, uh, indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge um, recognized as intelligible cultural in heritage. So we would like to um, take the opportunity of this dialogue to inform that this can serve within the uh, knowledge cluster or the capacity for engagement, specifically because UNESCO provides support uh, for some specific threatened um, uh, ancestral and traditional knowledge to be preserved by these communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contribution. I see uh, another representative of Canada would like to take the floor. You have the floor. Yes. Um, thank you, co-moderator. Um, I'm representing the Inuit Circumpolar Council, one of the Arctic Indigenous peoples. Um, and um, we believe that um, the Indigenous Peoples Platform should be modeled using examples of existing structures, in particular those elements that have been found to be working well internationally. We have such examples in the Arctic at the international level, as well as nationally in Canada. The proper engagement of indigenous peoples would be ensured by providing them with official seats at the indigenous platform together with the parties. This is already the case in the Arctic Council, where indigenous peoples organizations have the official status of permanent participants, which enables them to sit at the table together with Arctic state representatives up to the ministerial level. At the Indigenous Peoples Platform, seven seats representing the United Nations region should be provided for Indigenous Peoples. This way, a direct exchange at the appropriate levels is ensured between Indigenous Peoples and government representatives on a larger scale. To ensure that Indigenous knowledge is used to inform the relevant UNFCC processes, the Indigenous Peoples Platform could be mandated to further provide information on technical questions that is needed for decision making in a similar way that the IPCC is being asked to provide information. This would also be equivalent to the Arctic Council, where working groups provide information for the political process, which reach up to, um, up to the United Nations level. Examples are assessments produced by working groups of the Arctic Council that provide important input, which is used in the work of the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, has informed the negotiations of the Minimada Conventions on Mercury, the Convention on Biological Diversity, or even the climate change pro process. This work should be supported by sufficiently sized secretariat. To enab enable capacity building, Programs similar in structure to the Northern Contaminants Program in Canada could be set up. This program, short NCP, is managed by a committee made up of federal and regional government departments, as well as in the Indigenous representatives. The NCP provides funding for technical work, scientific studies, utilization of Indigenous knowledge, and supports community-based monitoring. The NCP has resulted in capacity building that enables indigenous organizations like the Inuit Circumpolar Council Canada to do technical work on the issue and provide valuable contributions also at the international scale. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. Very good examples exist and can and should be used in the development of a functional and successful indigenous platform. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, we have another representative of the Indigenous Peoples Forum. You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you. And I would like to thank also the, uh, the governments that have spoken very positively and who are expressing support as well as respect to the Indigenous knowledge holders. Um, 
just to answer one of the questions that was asked, what is the best uh, and effective exchange of experiences? Um, as the special rapporteur has said, our traditional knowledge is very much context-based. It is based on our relations with the lands, and so our knowledge should also be exchanged in that manner. So we are proposing the holding of thematic um, exchanges that can be ecosystem based so that people, indigenous peoples who are forest based can share their experiences among other forest dwellers and, uh, and also for marine um, based indigenous peoples that can uh, have that exchanges. So then the thematic um, exchanges can build up to the international level, but we believe that our traditional knowledge holders would find it much more useful and relevant to have those exchanges happen either at the national or regional levels with a very specific theme. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very uh, concrete suggestion. I do not see any other requests for the floors. However, we still have another 20 minutes. May I invite you to take a look at those uh, questions uh, that uh, we posed uh, earlier. How can uh, the platform facilitate exchange of experiences and sharing of best practices? How can the platform facilitate the integration of the indigenous peoples and local communities' uh, experiences? And how can the platform build capacity of the indigenous peoples? Uh, and, uh, uh, okay, uh, thank you. UNESCO, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, uh, moderator. I wanted to uh, just bring up some additional points in relation to some of the work that we have in going uh, uh, in Africa with pastoral peoples. And this census connects uh, to the statement that was just made before about the importance for indigenous peoples and indigenous knowledge to be considered at the national and regional level. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, UNESCO has been working with networks uh, uh, in Africa with pastoral peoples uh, in Chad, uh, in Burkina Faso, uh, in uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya, uh, where there's a sharing of experience uh, amongst uh, pastoral peoples in relation to uh, their observation about weather and climate. Uh, what's interesting and what I thought would be useful for this group to consider is uh, some of the uh, areas that are emerging have been identified as, as challenges for uh, future work. Uh, for example, in the interactions between uh, scientists and pastoral peoples, uh, we see that uh, uh, the indigenous knowledge and uh, about bioindicators are important. They're looking at the physical environment as well as the biological environment as uh, providing indicators for <clears throat> Uh, the uh, seasonal, uh, the next, the upcoming season, and uh, but they're in the dialogue with uh, the meteorologists and climate scientists. Uh, there's um, uh, the dialogue is not always so easy because the meteorologists uh, have knowledge which is compartmentalized into a discipline. So they have the physical science knowledge about uh, observations of uh, precipitation, about wind, uh, but when it comes to the indigenous peoples trying to talk to them about biological indicators, suddenly the, the scientists cannot interact in dialogue. So you need to have scientists from different disciplines that are also coming to the table in order to be able to uh, exchange in an effective way with indigenous knowledge, which is much more holistic and dealing with a wide range of factors which are not only the climate, uh, physical environment, but also the biological environment, and then also important social components and cultural components, which also need to be taken into consideration. Uh, one other small point is that very often the knowledge that is being shared in the pastoral networks uh, in Africa is qualitative rather than quantitative, in the sense that uh, from the scientists are bringing uh, information on the, uh, monitoring sea surface temperature, they're using uh, global models, uh, prediction models, uh, they're looking at uh, average precipitation over very large territories. Uh, on the other hand, the local communities, they need to have, uh, in order for uh, the information coming from science to be useful for them, it needs to be more localized. There's a scale challenge. Uh, there's a, also a challenge that uh, um, the, the knowledge 
is more about when will the rain begin? When is, what is the moment of the onset of rain? And what will be the quality of that rain? Whether it'll be a hard rainfall or a very short period of time in a very concentrated area, it's not the same as uh, uh, in terms of their uh, livelihood and their needs. Um, so that the scientific information which is coming in a quantitative way, which is just mean rainfall for uh, over a large territory is not useful. So the dialogue in a platform can be very uh, important in order to bring together and understand together what knowledge can be brought to the table from both sides and how to ensure that the scientific knowledge uh, is uh, targeting information and providing information to local communities that is important for the maintenance of their livelihoods and their priorities. So I think that in the, the proposal here uh, with the three different um, elements that have been identified, also make keeping in mind the, the very strong interconnections amongst those three elements is very important. So not to, uh, say, fall into the trap of developing each of them separately, but m ensuring because they have such strong interconnections amongst them, it's very important to main those, maintain those interconnections and also the interconnection between discussion, of course, at the international level, regional level, down to the national level is also very important because there'll be important lessons learned that will flow uh, from the bottom up and then also guidance from the international level down to the national level, whether it's adaptation plans or other national policy processes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that additional information. Uh, the, the UN representative. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Co-moderator. I just uh, wanted to take the floor to, again, <clears throat> uh, add some points in, in what I mentioned earlier. And one of the points that I'd like to stress as well, and I saw this also in the ILO submission to the uh, on this issue, is uh, the support for indigenous livelihood systems. As we all know, uh, the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples is very much linked with their livelihoods. And uh, Douglas earlier mentioned about pastoralists uh, in Asia and in several parts of uh, of, uh, of the world, there are, there are also uh, shifting cultivators, of course, reindeer herders, for instance. These livelihood systems of indigenous peoples are also very much uh, related to how they can contribute in terms of uh, adaptation as well as mitigation of uh, climate change. So I, I think that it's uh, we shouldn't, uh, if we want to deal with the issue in a holistic and integrated manner, we need to look into all these, the, the links between the livelihood systems, their traditional uh, natural resource management systems, and also the uh, the, the, the uh, the way that these are either enhanced or undermined. It's important to always see what are the obstacles in terms of the capacities of indigenous peoples to practice their innovations, traditional knowledge and practices. And uh, what are the policies that the governments are developing that ensure this, uh, this, the, the, the reinforcement of these uh, knowledge systems. Uh, the, the other issue I just want to mention is that uh, uh, I think the the stress on the co-generation of knowledge is something that also has to be uh, emphasized because, uh, as as was mentioned earlier, somebody mentioned that the 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 IP best conclusion. Uh, on the, e the equal validity of traditional knowledge systems with Western scientific knowledge, is really a conclusion that that uh, has been reached after um, after many uh, researches have been done, and such conclusion should really be be communicated effectively to decision makers, so that uh, decision makers who tend to look at traditional knowledge as a lower form of knowledge will be able to uh, to change that those kinds of mindsets because the policies that will be developed will now uh, acknowledge that the equal validity of these different knowledge systems and how these knowledge systems are helping each other to be able to reach uh, and, and uh, achieve the solutions that we are all looking for. And finally, uh, just to say that uh, all these are also linked with the sustainable development goals. And this has also been mentioned in several of the submissions that we cannot separate this platform uh, 
from the discussion of how the sustainable development goals, particularly those environmental goals that are already acknowledged goals to be met by every by, by everybody. So I think uh, if we want to be holistic and integrated, uh, these kinds of considerations have to be taken into account. Thank you very much, co-moderator. Uh, thank you very much, uh, again, for your additional information. Uh, Canada, you have another representative? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And again, I thank the uh, panel that presented the opening session as well as the framing session and others who have spoken. Uh, the segue was actually provided by UNESCO and uh, uh, just to what I was going to say, we look at uh, the forum or what we're going to do with this platform, we have to consider the reality of indigenous peoples in the world. We have some indigenous peoples who have over time become states, but we also have indigenous peoples who are nested within states. Uh, we have other indigenous peoples in states, for example, like Bolivia, that are recognized as part of the 22 indigenous peoples are part of the state, the plurinational state of Bolivia. We have indigenous people in, in Canada, for example, we have over 73 indigenous nations. Uh, our country is a large country, Canada, Ghana. It, it, it encompasses um, three oceans. It has 21 ecoregions, 17 bioregions. And the indigenous peoples have that knowledge of where they live. When we talk about these clusters, the second cluster is interesting, but the second cluster, uh, we, we think of the second cluster as the solutions only. I think indigenous people will be able to tell us and tell everyone that there are already experienced losses. Most indigenous people tell us, and do tell us, at least in Canada, that uh, we have lost a lot. We're losing tremendously. The race is against us. And I think it's important when we talk about that second cluster that maybe we should acknowledge the, the loss and the impacts that are already occurring. This will help decision makers realize how much quicker they have to work, how much more diligently they have to work, and also how vital it is to include and involve the indigenous people in this trying to at least stem the degress of our environment. Furthermore, I don't think we need to convince party states uh, of the need for such a platform that's already been discussed and sort of agreed to. But also when we talk about UNDRIP, we tend to forget the Article 42 that talks about the very survival of Indigenous people. Uh, indigenous people, I come here representing the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. Our community stretches from coast to coast. We do not live on reserves. We live throughout the land. And uh, our impacts, we, we see them daily occurring. And uh, they're very expensive impacts. They're expensive to the state and expensive to our very livelihoods. Uh, we have rights in Canada, and some states don't have rights. These rights are being eroded too. So we have to look at the question down the road. Who is going to be responsible for the redress of our losses? And our losses economically, socially, and our losses of knowledge. The plant life is changing. Elders tell me this Bogosi is no longer as potent as it was 40 years ago. It's changed its chemical composition. These are the realities that we have to face that are the effects of climate change on our environment. But thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, uh, information. And uh, I'd then like to invite Peru. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we would like to, um, to stress here how Peru is at this very moment working with uh, the indigenous people's representatives. Um, we work in a collaboratively manner, uh, taking into account the public national policies in conjunction with the um, international agreements that we have, such as the Paris Agreement or the Nagoya Protocol under the CBD. Um, we are um, actually trying to, to have a very practical approach on this work, 
we are starting a discussion on what would be the um, um, the 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 um, ¿cómo se dice? aporte the, the contribution of uh, of the views and the approaches of indigenous peoples to for instance the um, the work that we're doing right now in order to implement the nationally determined contributions and even when these might be a very nationally um, uh, determined approach even even to to make the implementation we think that maybe the platform would help also to uh, share these kinds of um, experiences so uh, the contributions of the knowledge of indigenous peoples is very well recognized uh, in the work that we are doing at this very moment in Peru. And uh, we are ready to work under the, under the agreements that we might reach at this meeting. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Peru. New Zealand. Uh, thank you, co-chair. And thank you to the panelists and everyone who has spoken before me. Mm, I just want to elaborate on New Zealand's initial uh, intervention, just with a brief comment, to say that New Zealand really supports the proposal to develop a robust platform that outlines agreed short, medium and long term objectives and outcomes that are both useful, pra practical and pragmatic for local communities and Indigenous peoples. This short, medium, and long term, uh, we see is really essential. Thank you. Thank you very much, New Zealand. I do not see any other requests for the floor. Uh, colleagues, we deliberately planned uh, the uh, dialogue uh, in a manner that would allow us to meet this morning, have a break this afternoon and tomorrow morning, and we resume tomorrow afternoon. And the reason for that is that you have heard exchanges among uh, each other right now. I would like you to go uh, this afternoon and uh, tomorrow morning and elaborate more on what you see are the functions of it, having heard uh, exchanges among yourselves, because we would really like to get more concrete uh, ideas based on these three guiding questions on what these functions should be. That would, and we'll have another session tomorrow afternoon to address those functions again. But then we then uh, go over to the structure because we think once we know the functions, that will then determine, uh, give us some idea of what the structure of the platform would be. So having heard some new ideas, hopefully from others, you can uh, build on those, uh, use the guiding questions, also reflect on the issue of the resource implications of what those functions could be, because indeed that will also assist us uh, in the structure. And then finally, what additional value could the platform bring to the work that is already ongoing uh, in the world with indigenous peoples? And we heard a lot of information already about the ongoing work in Antigua and Barbuda, uh, in Bolivia, in Canada. How can, uh, what added value would the platform bring to that work? Or how do we capture that work into the platform. Again, uh, things for you to uh, mull over uh, this afternoon, uh, over lunch, over supper tonight, in between, tomorrow morning, dream about it tonight, uh, and then uh, come with some uh, concrete suggestions for us, and then we then delve on the structure, because this is when your input is, uh, is really required. Thank you very much. Have a good lunch, and uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow afternoon. <laughs>